And this is uh, live. Uh, thank you. Good day, everyone, for uh, joining this uh, second webinar uh, session leading with LiDAR organized by Leosphere, a Vesala company today. Uh, we will be focusing on NACEL uh, mounted LiDAR in wind energy and power performance testing. My name is Betty Sablon. I am the regional sales manager for Europe and Latin America at Leosphere. So today, we have the chance of welcoming two uh, guest speakers, uh, Alex uh, Pradel, measurement engineer at NG Green. Alex Pradel holds a Master of Science in Electrical Energy. He has more than 10 years of experience in the wind uh, industry, and his areas of expertise include wind measurement, performance analysis, and energy yield assessment. At uh, NG Green, he focuses on nacelle mounted LiDAR measurements and its applications. He is involved in every stage of the projects, including LiDAR installation on the turbine, as well as data analysis. We also have the chance uh, today uh, to have Mr. Pedro Salvador from Siemens Gamesa. Pedro earned his uh, master's degree at Universidad do Porto in mechanical engineering, specializing in energy. He developed his master thesis about wind power and lidar measurements. Pedro's career began in Bosch, Mexico, and in 2016, he moved to Denmark and embarked on his wind power career at Siemens Gamesa, where he focuses on assessing and enhancing the performance of the company's prototype turbine and rotors. Last but not least, our nacelle mounted lidar expert at Leosphere, Julien Tissot. Julien has been with Leosphere since 2017 and involved with uh, wind energy for more than seven years. As a wind energy scientist and engineer, Julien is engaged in R&D for onshore and offshore projects. He also provides wind and data expertise for new and existing LiDAR applications to both Leosphere customers and employees. And he's actively involved in several standardization meetings and working groups such as IC50-3, IEA Task 32. Prior to Leosphere, Julien also had uh, hands-on experience in wind farm operations, including the execution of wind power performance testing using LiDAR. So uh, the goal of today's uh, webinar session is uh, for you to learn how does nacelle mounted LiDAR work on the functional, operational, technical uh, performance and measurement aspect of it. Uh, um, you will also uh, have an overview of uh, the new WindCube nacelle uh, mounted LiDAR, formerly called uh, Wind Iris, for those who know, and uh, our new software called WindCube Insight Analytics. And obviously, we'll have the two interventions of our two guest speakers from NG and Siemens Gamesa uh, in regards to their own experience with our nacelle mounted LiDAR technology. Quick uh, housekeeping and tips uh, during this webinar session. If uh, you have any questions, uh, we will be conducting a Q&A session uh, at the end of this webinar session. So feel free to post anonymously your questions in the window dedicated to questions. If you have any trouble connecting, hearing, uh, click on the question mark icon at the bottom of your screen. And uh, a couple of uh, resources that are your full disposal and downloadable, uh, such as documents and uh, brochures related to today's session. One last thing, please note that this uh, webinar session will be recorded and the link will be sent to you after today's webinar. Uh, one last thing before we start with our first presentation. Uh, we would love if uh, the attendees could uh, answer this poll question to better understand who is our audience today, and uh, we will show the results in the next slide. So let's, let's take 10 to 15 seconds to, to give everyone time to uh, select what are the primary focus areas. So I guess uh, we are ready to move on to the results. Let's display the results. So there we go, 67% for onshore, 27% offshore, 34% development, 
35% operations, 10% turbine manufacturing, 32% consulting or research, 9.4% other. Thank you very much, everyone, for participating. That will give us a better idea on how to lead the Q&A questions. And without further ado, uh, I will leave the floor to my dear colleague, uh, Julien, who will take over uh, with the presentation. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Baptiste. So, hello, everyone. I'm Julian from the research department here at Leosphere, and I'm in charge of understanding and developing the application of Leosphere NAS and LiDAR. Uh, my goal with this presentation today is to give you first an historical context of our line of NAS based LiDAR. Then I'll try to cover some basic principles about the technology behind the wind speed that the LiDAR provides. And finally, I'd like to give you an overview of the necessary steps for conducting a, a power performance testing, uh, which is the main application of uh, our LiDAR. So first, a, a timeline. Um, the first nacelle LiDAR produced by Leosphere was the Windaris 2B. I think it was first commercialized around 2011, and it could retrieve the horizontal wind speed at a height up to 400 meters in front of the turbine. And a few years later, uh, in 2015, Leosphere released the four-beam version of this LiDAR, which was and still is uh, able to retrieve some additional information about the wind field in front of the turbine, namely the wind shear and the wind veer. I think a few days ago, Leosphere released uh, the upgrade of this uh, wind iris, which is now called uh, WindCube, as, as Baptiste say, WindCube Nacen. And um, I'll show you briefly what are the key differences, the, the new features in the next slide. Notice that I also included some logo uh, below the units. That is to say that uh, at Leosphere we have always provided um, uh, tools for the user to analyze uh, his data. And uh, it was first a simple Excel, then it became a MATLAB uh, executable, and now it's a dedicated web app called WinCubit site that was also launched uh, uh, a month ago, or something like that. Um, so here are some technical details about this new version of the WinCube nacelle. I'm not going to go too much into detail here. I, I just want to use the 3D model below to illustrate our scanning pattern, our geometry. Um, so as you can see, we have two beams uh, that are inclined upwards and two beams inclined downwards, forming a rectangle, which, which increases with the distance. Along one beam, one line of sight, the, the 20 range gates are measured at the same time, and I will explain how in one of the next slides. Um, but first, what's, what's new? So what are the differences between the 2015 design and uh, the new one? Um, the main evolution, uh, aside from the color, is the, the range of the system. We now shoot at uh, up to 700 meters in front of the turbine instead of the previous maximum limit of 450 meters. It's quite important because, um, as we said, the, the LiDAR is mainly used for power curve verification, and uh, the IEC requires a measurement at 2.5 D, uh, D for diameter. So in front uh, of the turbine. So for the newest large offshore wind farm, 450 meters was starting to be a bit too short for the main application of the slider. Um, the other big difference, as you see here, is the number of available range gates. Uh, you can now set 20 of them instead of the previous maximum of 10. Uh, this is mainly explained by an upgrade of the inboard computer, which increased the, the processing power of the unit. All right, so you now have an idea of what the LiDAR can do. Uh, with the next slide, I want to go inside the box and briefly describe the physics involved in measuring the wind. So the main output of our LiDAR is the, um, the, the, the wind speed, and uh, to measure it, the LiDAR relies on the Doppler effect. I'm sure most of uh, you are familiar with the small drawing uh, on the left. It represents the Doppler effect applied to the sound generated by an ambulance in the street. And in this uh, case, the person on the right would hear a higher pitch than the person on the left because the ambulance was moving towards him. So um, the same thing happened for light, and our LiDAR, they, they use this principle. 
um, if you replace sound by light and uh, the ambulance by the particle in the air, you now have the setup on the right where the, the listener is actually our system. To be slightly more uh, exact or technical, in our case, um, it's the LiDAR that is actively emitting light um, at a known frequency and, they, and is then observing the Doppler shift on the return signal. Um, talking about return signal, so this slide is a bit more complex, but let me explain. Uh, the figure here represents two things. On the top, you have the path that the pulses follow um, uh, it's, the, it's one of the beams of the LiDAR, and it's the same as in the previous slide. Uh, on the lower part, you have the electrical signal that is generated by the light, uh, reflected by the particle in the atmosphere, and then detected back in the LiDAR. So that would be the, the purple line. Uh, here we can link time and distance because the speed of light uh, is a known constant, and therefore, the, the electrical signal can be cut into chunks, if you want, that, that will correspond to the different range gates set by the user. So for 20 range gates, I would cut this signal into 20 pieces that, will, that, that I will then analyze independently. And we do that for each pulses that are sent to each line of sight for the four beams of the LiDAR. Um, so now we have 20 different uh, radial wind speeds along each beam, which are represented here by the, the small red dots uh, um, on the 3D model. And uh, we want to combine them to calculate the horizontal wind speed at a height. Uh, this horizontal wind speed is the main output of the LiDAR, and it's uh, the one that we use to replace the value from the MET mass, uh, the cup anemometer. To calculate that, it's actually quite uh, straightforward. At each gate, we combine the radial wind speed per height, assuming flow homogeneity. Then, uh, using a shear and a veer profile, we can interpolate the, the value to provide an horizontal wind speed at any given height, uh, including sub height. All right, so that's it for the physics side of this presentation. Um, now you have an horizontal wind speed at sub height, so what can you do with that? Um, as I said, the, the main application is power performance testing, uh, where you independently measure the wind speed in front of the turbine and the power produced by it in order to verify the power curve and, more importantly, the, the AEP, the annual energy production. Uh, you could also use the, the data set for other type of analysis, like to find uh, and correct for the potential yaw misalignment, meaning making sure that your turbine is aligned with the wind. Or you could calculate the nascent transfer function, which will allow you to monitor your turbine even after the campaign. Mm. And of course, you, you can do any type of uh, research uh, project involving uh, wind measurement. I think here it's also interesting to, to note that one data set can usually be used for many applications especially if you plan your measurement campaign properly. Um, so now we go back to power performance testing, and, and I'll go with you through the different steps of a, a typical measurement campaign. So I divide it into four arbitrary phases, um, the first one being the design of the campaign, where you plan things ahead as much as possible, then the verification, where, uh, as for any other measurement device, you check the quality of the system. Uh, you, you then have the, the operation phase, which would include uh, installation and monitoring throughout the campaign. And finally, the, the analysis. So this is when you, you actually get to extract value from the data you collected. Um, regarding the design of the campaign, the first obvious uh, things to, thing to do is, is to select a wind turbine to analyze. So maybe you already know which specific turbine you, you want to check. In this case, it's done. But, but maybe you, you don't and you, you just have a wind farm in mind or a, a wind turbine tap type uh, in mind. So uh, in this case, you can optimize the length of your campaign during the design phase by, for example, choosing the one with the, the biggest opening uh, sector. 
the, I, the IEC has a, a section dedicated to the analysis of obstacle and terrain. And uh, an example of, of the result from this analysis can be seen here on the right. Um, during the design phase, you, you actually have another mission, which is to plan your installation ahead in order to minimize the length of time that you will be stopping the, the, the wind turbine. So you want to have all the authorization from the ONM regarding the actual installation of your sensor. And it's also important to plan ahead for the, the remote access to your LiDAR. So you could be using a, a 4G modem, or you could also connect your LiDAR directly to the local network of the wind farm. Uh, but in this case, you should make sure that you're taking this into consideration uh, well before the installation date, because these, these IT things often uh, they, they take time to organize. Uh, it's important also to say that a good connection to Internet, it, it's, it, it's um, important for time synchronization between your, your sensors and the, the wind turbine. On verification, um, this part could actually be done in parallel with the previous I explained just before. But uh, regarding verification, there is usually two stages uh, when we verify our LiDAR. The first one happens at Leosphere during manufacturing or uh, maintenance. Uh, we calibrate the main constants from our LiDAR out of the atmosphere, and we then verify them in the, in the atmosphere against a calibrated LiDAR of the same type. Um, then, if your campaign is a contractual power performance testing, the, the system will also be calibrated by a third party at an independent test site. There are several of them, and uh, for example, on the right here, you can see a, a picture from the site uh, of the NDGL at uh, Janebi in, in Germany. Uh, the idea there is to assess the uncertainty of the radial wind speed, so the one along the line of sight, the beam, and the, and the one we discussed just before, and, and then to propagate this uncertainty on the wind field reconstruction algorithm. Uh, the data analyst will then use this calibration report to calculate the uncertainty on the power curve, and therefore the uncertainty on the AEP estimation. I don't think I'll go into detail regarding the, the calibration. It's a whole science in itself, but if you're interested, I listed some key documents uh, on the side of, of this slide. Um, I could just add that um, the calibration usually takes between two to four months according to the setup of the test site you, you choose. So um, now that the system is ready for installation and the measurement can begin. Uh, regarding the installation itself, again, I think I'll guess, uh, I think I'll, I'll be saving some time for the question because I know that Alex, our uh, next uh, speaker, has some slides on this topic too. Uh, I'll just say that you also provide uh, training and support for installation and uh, has created checklists to assist you during the, this phase that really needs to be orchestrated properly. Um, this, uh, this is really when the the careful planning during the design phase should pay off. Uh, once the installation is complete and the turbine is back online, you enter a, a measurement phase to ensure that everything is running properly. It's uh, usually best practice to, to organize some type of daily or weekly check of all your sensors that you, you have installed on the wind turbine. Uh, that's what I mean here by uh, monitoring. You could also use the, this frequent check to retrieve your data if you haven't set uh, an automated way of doing it, like a FTP server, for example. Um, the next, uh, but uh, the next is uh, and last step, sorry, of your um, power performance testing is the actual analysis of your data set. Uh, all your sensors have been collecting data for a few months now, and you think that you have enough data to work with. So you decide to start the analysis of the power curve and the, the AAP. Um, <laughs> again, this could be done a bit in parallel with the monitoring phase just before. Um, regarding the, the, the data completion, there is uh, actually some helpful rules in the IEC that uh, will help you to decide if your data set is complete or not. Um, in the analysis itself, the first step would be, again, to make sure that your data are well synchronized. Um, and then for filtering, you basically want to select a time period when everything was working nominally. 
Uh, that includes, for example, uh, the wind speed coming from an open sector, undisturbed by the wake of a neighboring turbine or local obstacle, and, uh, of course, the, the wind turbine being in a system okay state or something similar. So the whole analysis process can't be defined as uh, uh, being uh, simple, uh, but uh, everything about the analysis is really well described uh, into detail in the IEC 12-1. And if you follow this document, it really covers the whole process and it gives all the equation you need to compute power curve and AEP, as well as the, as the whole uncertainty assessment for, for each of these. Um, I said it at the beginning, uh, LEOSER has provided tools to do this type of data analysis since the, the first slide down in, in 2011. Uh, at the time it was a, a spreadsheet, but then it became a MATLAB tool and, and recently, based on, on, on this experience, and of course the best practice that the wind industry developed uh, since, we have uh, started a, a web-based application called uh, WindCube uh, Insight that covers power curve, AEP assessment, but also some other application of the NASA LiDAR, uh, such as uh, the, um, the YOMIS alignment and the calculation of the NASA transfer function. So that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I hope I gave you a, a good overview on the technology itself and also uh, what the power performance uh, campaign uh, look like. So now I'm happy to hand it off to our next speaker, Alex Pradel from NG. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Julien. So I'm Alex Pradel from uh, NG Green and I will give you a very quick uh, feedback from some nacelle mounted lidar campaigns we did in the in the past uh, just a quick word about ng you probably know ng is the french uh, multinational uti utility um, very focused now on zero carbon transmission uh, transition um, investing a lot on renewables you can see the figures here uh, I'm part of NG Green, which is the French uh, branch for uh, renewables uh, for wind and solar. Uh, we operate uh, 1.7 uh, gigawatt throughout the country with uh, 117 wind farms. We also work on solar. We are more than 500 employees. So as an operator, um, I wanted to to share uh, how it started um, using uh, nacelle mounted LiDAR. So since um, 2007, let's say, we wanted to get some measurements from um, free wind speed because we wanted to, to get uh, the opportunity to follow up the performance of our turbines. Um, but it was not fully satisfying. First of all, it was uh, very expensive. So in, in 2014, we decided to use uh, nacelle mounted lidars. Um, in these, in those days, we detected a lot of your misalignment uh, issues, uh, which is one of the application of the nacelle mounted lidar, as uh, Julien told you before. Um, so we were very focused on this, and we corrected almost uh, 50 uh, turbines that had. Uh, um, static your misalignment issues. We took advantage of the campaign to perform uh, power curves uh, before and after correcting this uh, your misalignment. So we got uh, um, an assessment of the of the gain of uh, in terms of AEP. Um, I will talk again about the the, the results of those um, AEP gain. But first, I wanted to share uh, some very basic operational uh, topics. Um, we installed, as I said before, uh, many um, nacelle mounted LiDARs. So I think it might be interesting for you to know that uh, it's a very uh, easy uh, task. It's only half a day for installing a nacelle mounted LiDAR on a turbine, but um, it's several weeks of preparation. Uh, and I just wanted to share with you, uh, from my opinion, what are the, the tricky parts of the, um, of the procedure, let's say. Uh, so I just list here some points that I think must be uh, 
very well anticipated. Uh, first of all, everything related to health and safety risks associated with uh, uh, working at height, winching the LIDAR uh, on the turbine and, and things like every other um, works on a turbine must be correctly taken into account. This is a priority for all the industry and for NG also. Um, another point is the alignment of the LiDAR with the rotor. Um, this part of the procedure is a bit tricky because it will depend on the turbine model. You actually want your, li you want your LiDAR to get a, a correct alignment with the, with the axis of the with the rotor axis. So there's a procedure which is based on a laser uh, inside the nacelle. So you have to get some reference points that you know are correctly aligned with the rotor. Then you have to report the line uh, outside on the roof. Uh, this must be correctly uh, taken into account before uh, going on site. And if you need to drill holes uh, to install a tripod, so, of course, we, we would prefer having a bracket uh, in order to avoid drilling holes on the roof. Um, I think Pedro later on will talk about some brackets maybe for offshore. But uh, in onshore application, uh, very often you need to install a tripod. And as you are drilling holes on a nacelle roof, you can, have, you can have some doubts about waterproofness. Uh, for example, uh, before, uh, uh, I mean, during the campaign and after the campaign. So you really need to, to, to get all the parties with you and you don't want to get, um, uh, let's say, um, a disclaimer from the manufacturer that you're losing some kind of warranty because of the holes and things like that. So this is a very operational topic, but uh, important. Uh, anyway, once those points are considered and correctly anticipated, uh, you can imagine it's very uh, easy to install a, a nacelle mounted LiDAR on a turbine. Um, it's much easier than a MET mast. And that's why we are very uh, focused on it at, uh, at NG Green. Um, so now I'm, I'm sharing with you some results. Um, so as I said before, we, the first cases we have with nacelle mounted LiDAR was to detect uh, important yaw misalignment, uh, static yaw misalignment. So what we did is that for some turbines, so here it's five turbines we've got with three different manufacturers on three different wind farms. Um, we performed the power curve before and after correcting the yaw uh, misalignment. What we can see is that there's a good correlation between the gain we've got by correcting the yaw and, uh, and, the, and the initial uh, misalignment. So we were very satisfied with these results. Uh, the more yaw realignment angle, the more AEP gain. So we paid back our, our campaigns, we can say. However, we also know that there was some limitations uh, in those results. And at, at this time, we did not have a formal, uh, uh, let's say, a formal standard, uh, because the, the actual standard we are using is the 61400-12-1. And we know, we actually know that this standard is not considering a nacelle mounted LiDAR. So we also, uh, could not calculate formally all the uncertainties uh, related to those uh, power curves. That's why I'm presenting here only the gain in terms of AEP because I think there are some bias and those bias, uh, some of those bias might be the same before and after correcting the yaw because I'm using here the same LiDAR uh, in the same turbine, the same setup before and after correcting the yaw. Uh, so, uh, we still think it's a correct uh, approximation of the, the gain when you correct the yaw misalignment. But to go deeper into details and to have a more, uh, let's say, a more formal uh, calculation of, the, of your power curve and your IEP, we, we, we really need a, a standard, a international standard. Um, that's why I'm putting here a, a slide to present uh, my understanding of what is actually 
happening right now on the on the committees. Uh, this is only my understanding of what is going to happen in the near future, but I'm not sure everything was um, completely uh, validated. Uh, anyway, um, so there will be a restructuration of the of the of the standard. It will be split into several different uh, documents. Some of them uh, will only deal with uh, power performance testing, uh, and other group of uh, standards will uh, deal with uh, wind measurement requirement itself. And uh, inside this uh, group of standards, there will be a new uh, a new standard, uh, 50-3, uh, which is supposed to be published, uh, if I'm not wrong, early 2021. And it will uh, give to the industry uh, a clear procedure for nacelle mounted LIDAR measurements. Uh, this, this, um, this standard will include, therefore, uh, minimum LIDAR requirements, a detailed procedure for white box LIDAR calibrations that uh, will bring uh, low uncertainties uh, in theory. And of course, how to calculate all the uncertainties and uh, all the measurement procedure for uh, for nacelle mounted LiDAR. So at NG Green, we really, uh, I mean, I personally uh, wish that for uh, flat terrain, because this standard will only uh, talk about flat terrain for the moment. Um, once this is published, uh, my, uh, my wish is that we can uh, convince the manufacturers to accept nacelle mounted LiDAR for contractual performance tests during the, the performance, uh, the, let's say the warranty period, um, instead of having to install a MetMast. Um, what we are thinking is that, uh, of course, if the warranty is not respected, then you will claim some liquidated damages or the manufacturer will have to do something. But uh, I also think that if you do the test and you respect the warranty, um, you actually decrease the risk of having a, an asset with a low performance. You, you actually have a new measurement that can uh, tells you that you reduced the uncertainties uh, related to the um, to the power curve and to the performance in the f in the future. So there must be a way. We are thinking about how to to do that, but there must be a, a way maybe to update the P90 values of your of your assets, and uh, and this is something uh, we are working on it. Um, in the future, we also uh, want to use our to use the opportunity of a nacelle mounted lidar to to get a new nacelle transfer function, or let's say to check if the nacelle transfer function from the manufacturer is uh, is correct. So you are you are um, you have some data available from the SCADA. You want to use. Um, you want to use it for uh, follow up, to follow up the performance. Uh, if you install the LiDAR, then you have the opportunity to check uh, its actual uh, free wind speed you are measuring. And also we are thinking about including uh, our own anemometer as an operator that could be, uh, let's say, calibrated to take into account uh, nacelle transfer function, but from the side of the operator. Uh, so this is a still in draft at uh, NG. We are not doing it yet, but we are thinking about it. Um, and last point here uh, is we are talking about flat terrain and we will talk about offshore, but when the terrain is moderately complex, I think uh, we could work on a second edition of this 50-3 uh, standard that would have another approach, but that could uh, allow us to get some measurements for moderately complex terrain, so we will follow up this uh, this new uh, this new standard if uh, in the in the future. Um, that's it from my side. So I wish uh, I um, it was clear. Uh, just um, my contribution to this webinar. Um, I will now give the microphone to uh, Pedro from uh, Siemens Gamesa that will uh, talk to you more uh, about uh, offshore wind, I think. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I hope you can hear me now. Okay. 
So my name is Pedro Salvador and I will present you today with the NASA Ladders Offshore at Siemens Camesa. And the first slide is just an overview of, of what I, where I come from in this uh, big company. So I come from this offshore technology uh, big department where, uh, where the new turbines for offshore are developed. Uh, and inside this technology, uh, yeah, I, I work for Roto Performance, which is a team that uh, works with anon design and blade design, uh, a lot of aerodynamic capabilities, uh, but also with noise and power curves, both uh, the creation of it, but also the validation of it. And uh, that's on the validation side where we commonly use LiDARs. So we are very, very much focused on LiDARs, both ground and nacelle. Uh, and here, yeah, I stated a bit of what we do with ladders and we do, we plan and we execute the com campaigns for our prototype turbines and we do some research projects on it. Um, we also set the requirements for our designers uh, to make the brackets that I will show later, which is something that is quite relevant, I think, for some of you. Uh, and the last point is that we are responsible for the cooperation with the ladder manufacturers that we have been doing quite well for for the last years to make sure that the ladders that are um, the ladders that are de that are developed are in line with the turbines that we are also develop de developing. We okay. So yeah, here is just a simple diagram to show how uh, power curve is usually. Uh, yeah, measured uh, you know, on a flat terrain onshore. So we have a turbine on the right side sensing the power and we have a met mast and why not a ground-based ladder sensing the wind at a certain distance. So all good until now. And then we go offshore and it gets quite tricky to install a met mast uh, offshore. It's possible, but it's extremely expensive. So uh, to solve this issue, um, we can install a nacelle ladder, and uh, that's uh, of course a much, much, much more reduced cost. Uh, this is the way we ha we have been doing uh, with our offshore customers for many years now. Uh, so we can say that the 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 necessity for having a reduction uh, in the cost of the measurement of the power curves leads to uh, an agreement uh, between us and the cu customers, even if the IC standard is still not uh, ready. Um, so, yeah, that is the main reason why yeah, we already do it for some years offshore and perhaps not so often onshore. Then uh, there are other advantages of uh, that we see of measuring uh, with the NASA ladder. One of them is that we can open the measurement sector. Uh, opening the measurement sector because if you have the met mast, you will, for example, need to uh, exclude the sector where the met mast is on wake. In this case, the ladder is always pointing towards the wind. So the only sectors that need to be removed is when the turbine is on the wake. So we have a wider sector. Uh, that means we have more points. That means that typically we can have a faster power curve. Of course, this will depend on on yeah, site layout and, and what inflow we have and so on. But in general, this yeah can be said. Yeah, another advantage is that we can measure inside induction zone, which directly for a power curve might not be super uh, relevant, but uh, it's it can be relevant for research purposes or, or or other things. Yeah. So yeah, here now to the bracket design. This is something that uh, yeah, Alex already mentioned, and I think uh, it's quite relevant to touch the topic. So I put here a slight, a small overview of uh, some some turbines we have in our fleet. Starting from the left side, on the onshore side, we have this G2 turbine, which in this case was a prototype we had in uh, Azur in Denmark uh, three years ago, and it's a 120 meter rotor. You can see I scaled it scaled more or less. I tried to scale the the turbines according to the rotor size. So you can see that. Uh, the ladder is on a tripod, the nacelle is quite spacey, so it's easy to drill holes safely and uh, yeah, install a ladder properly. However, when you, yeah, with time we are designing more and more uh, compact nacelles 
that's sometimes, for example, on the D3, the second picture, you cannot really walk on the roof. The, the canopy is fiberglass and it's rounded. So it makes it way more complicated to install a ladder. So we had to develop this brackets that is a pole. Uh, you can see it on the on this picture here. Then moving towards offshore for our platforms, D6, D7, and D8, we have been using typically a structure in front of the cooler, as you see here, where we install the ladder. We also have a second option that we use for mainly research projects, where we install a structure behind the cooler and we can uh, install more than one ladder. Then moving to the new generations, we have this DD193 and also DD200. This, uh, turbine, this turbine was the latest prototype erected in, uh, in our prototype test site in uh, Österreld in Denmark. And uh, yeah, we have already a bracket designed on the side of the cooler, as you can see, close to the to other instrumentation. We have also a, a scaffold where uh, you can uh, stand to install the ladder. For the most recently released turbine that you might have heard of, the DD222, uh, I cannot disclose much, but uh, here is the bracket that we, that we are also designing, where uh, it will be basically a, a, an arm that rotates inside and then rotates outside, so it will make the installation easier. Something that I want to mention before I move out of this bracket topic is that Drilling, all, drilling holes offshore uh, can lead to big problems with corrosion. Of course, this can be valid for onshore, uh, but especially offshore, we have uh, quite tight criteria for corrosion. So all our materials and components are very focused on uh, being corrosion proof. So any holes are kind of, yeah, can be a problem. So, so we really, uh, that, that's also why we put so much focus on designing these brackets offshore. And yeah. Next topic, as you saw, the rotor size is increasing quite a lot and quite rapidly. So I put here uh, the G2 that you had before and the DD222. So we have a 120 meter rotor and a 222 meter rotor. And you can see that for the G2, the point of measurement uh, is uh, here represented at 2.5 diameters, which is the recommended distance uh, that we use. And uh, that is within the range of the old generation of NASA ladders. You can see here represented with the red line. So for the G2, it's all good. But when we go for the DD222, then we are above the threshold. So that was a problem, but yeah, it's now solved as uh, Julien also mentioned. So this is the max range. I tried to scale it more or less. So you see that there is still some room between the yeah the 222 yellow dots in the end of the yellow line and the green line so we can see this in two ways we can see this on we can measure a bit further for this turbine and we can see as we can if if the rotor size increases uh, slightly we are still within the range which is very good still on the rotor size increase another challenge is the shear so of course, uh, the distance between the low tip and high tip increases. At this uh, 222 rotor, the distance is 222, of course, uh, 222 meters. So that's a, there is a wide variety of wind speeds along all this, uh, along the height. So having a representation of the full rotor only with one wind speed uh, can be a bit misleading. So the the way we see the measurements with NASA ladders going further is to uh, allow to measure at multiple heights. Uh, and uh, yeah, using multiple height measurements, then uh, we can transform this into uh, rotor equivalent twin speed, rails, rules. <laughs> uh, basically, it's, uh, it's what you, you might have seen on the IC edition two, if you are not uh, super familiar with it. Um, yeah, and this will reduce uncertainty of the power curve, which is uh, an ultimate goal here. Then uh, my last slides will be about uh, a, a, the last com uh, campaign with the uh, ladders that we have done 
which ended a few months ago. And it was in Asterild test site, and uh, it was on the DD-167 turbine. You can see here um, the, in the diagram that we have uh, the turbine on the right side. On the turbine, we had the NASA LiDAR mounted. And then for uh, comparison or for the reference, we had uh, a medium range and a long range. On the medium range, we had a met mast and the wind cube. And uh, at long range, we had only a wind cube. And uh, you can see here uh, some results. On the first line, we have the medium range, which is 372 meters, uh, which is the range, if you recall the, the previous slide that I showed, is the range that would, would also be covered with the old, uh, old generation of the ladders. And on the bottom line, we have the 550 meter range, the long range, which is above what uh, the normal, the old wind iris 4 beam could cover. And we can see that uh, on the scatter plot, where I have on the x-axis the reference, so the cup anemometer on the medium range and the wind cube on the long range. Uh, and we have on the y-axis the, the NASA ladder wind speed. We can see that the correlation, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite good. And it's more important than good, it's that it's equivalent on the top and on the bottom. So for medium range and, low, and long range, the results are quite similar, uh, making this, uh, yeah, proving that we have a long range ladder here. Um, on the right side, we have a power curve. So this is the ultimate outcome of, of the NASA ladder campaign. Um, you can see that uh, the scatter is similar. It's slightly higher scatter on the bottom part. Uh, that I don't think it's related with the ladder. It's mostly related with uh, the fact that we measure further away. So there is some time that the wind takes to go from the measurement point to the turbine that can increase the scatter. So yeah, it was a good campaign. We yeah we look forward for more more uh, campaigns with uh, research campaigns with Leosphere, and that was that was it for me. Uh, I will end over to, is it to Baptiste, I guess? Yes, uh, Pedro, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, uh, for sharing your experience. And thank you very much, Alex, as well, for sharing your experience. But uh, we're still going to be with you guys in a minute as uh, we are now starting our Q&A uh, session. So thank you very much, everyone, for participating to this Q&A session. A lot of questions are coming through now. Uh, throughout uh, the, this, this webinar. Um, so uh, we won't be able to answer all the questions. Make sure that we'll get back to you if they are not being answered. Uh, so let's get started. Um, so this is, uh, this is a, a question addressed to Alex. So did you compare the cost of a power performance test using a MET mast and a nacelle mounted LiDAR? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a good question. Um, it's hard to to do it uh, very um, accurately, but uh, I would say that for onshore we are around, uh, uh, let's say, 15%. Like uh, you, with the nacelle mounted lidar, if you take everything into account, it would be around 15 or 20%. And uh, I don't know for offshore, you can imagine it's. <laughs> Uh, something like uh, I don't know. Uh, it's around the one percent. I don't know the, the cost of a mast offshore. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it should be around one yeah. percent. If my calculations are right. <laughs> All right. Uh, th thank you, guys. Another. I guess this one is more like a global questions uh, with with different questions inside regarding. Uh, how does that work, like um, installation of the LiDAR alignment with the rotors, placement on the nasal, how do we agree with turbine manufacturer where we're going to place the LiDAR? As, as Pedro already mentioned, it, we, we, you design specific brackets. How do we agree on the procedures, placement, alignment, uh, to make sure that everyone agrees on, on the way we, we perform a, a good power performance testing? And this is a question for Alex and Pedro, I guess. Okay, I can start. Uh, I think, first of all, if you as an operator wants to do a campaign without involving uh, any uh, any other party, uh, you will face some different problems than if you plan everything uh, contractually. Um, 
so of course uh, you you might use a tripod to to install a lidar and you 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 make your own procedure if you want to do your own calculations but if everything has been prepared uh, as a contractual uh, phase before uh, installing the the, before the construction of the wind farm, I think um, all the works that Pedro is doing, for example, might help a lot because it will be prepared everything, the brackets. Um, so it will very it will depend on what kind of measurements you want to to perform and, and on the context. Uh, I don't know if you want to say something, uh, Pedro. Um, yeah, I, I can say that, uh, especially offshore, you should definitely contact us uh, onshore as well. So I think it's the same. Um, typically, offshore, it's it's already uh, kind of obvious that we will measure with a with an assay ladder. Uh, on onshore, uh, it's sometimes uh, the customer decides many years later that he wants to do a, a power curve performance test with an assay ladder. I just suggest that uh, they contact either. Uh, a company like Angi or, or, or us, but definitely we should be aware just to make sure that we we have the right setup. But uh, again, right. I, I, let me just say that I'm very focused on offshore, so I don't I'm not completely aware of on on how the the logistics are uh, on onshore. But uh, yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, I guess these questions is, are for the the people sitting at the at the at the IEC committee. When will the IEC 50-3 be published for the wider public? So I, I think I can take this one. Uh, the um, the IEC is currently uh, as a validated draft, and uh, the the official publication should be beginning of next year if everything goes uh, as planned. So beginning of next year, you should be able to to have it. Uh, I should also say that if your company is part of uh, the National uh, Standardization Committee, you can already have access to the draft for review. So some of you have already access to that. All right. Thanks, Julia. Another question: uh, How is it to is it to convince the NVGL or UL? Uh, and other bankable consultants to use this equipment. Um, if if anyone uh, has 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 an opinion on this, uh, Alex, Pedro, or Julien. I think they are uh, those you mentioned. They were very involved in the in the in the in the standard to be published and i think they are already uh, accepting it um without I, 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 but uh, yeah <laughs> i'm not uh, from those uh, companies you mentioned but i i don't think uh, about the um, any problem about it now for the bank uh, i imagine they would follow the the standards uh, of the industry but uh, I don't, I don't know either. All right, thanks, uh, thanks, Alex. Um, can someone perform the power curve calculation directly from the NASA lidar's interface? So by NASA lidar's interface, I, I assume uh, we're talking about the WinCube uh, uh, Insight Analytics software. Maybe it's a question for you, Julien. Yeah. yeah. So the the analysis itself is not done on the system. But uh, it, it can be done on the, the software we we have, uh, which is the, the Nacelle, uh, in, uh, sorry, the WinCube Insight. So basically, not on the system during the campaign, but uh, to inside the software linked to the system. All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, another question: so How long does it take to perform power curve uh, measurements, and why? Is it faster with a lighter than a met mast? Uh, I, I, I can uh, try to explain uh, again. Um, so it's it's faster, not because yeah, it's faster, but it depends on the conditions and what we are looking for. Uh, the idea is that it's faster because we can have a wider sector uh, than we can with the with a met mast. 
So if you imagine that you have a turbine and a mat mast, you will probably uh, restrain the sector for, I don't know, plus minus 30 degrees with the alignment of the turbine and the mat mast. That could be a, a potential setup, but it will be this narrow sector. While if you have a, um, an acid ladder, then you can actually, you are always pointing towards the wind. So you can yeah, have a, a, a way wider sector, having more points, being then faster to have a power curve. That's the idea. All right. All good. Thanks, Pedro. Um, maybe a question for Alex. Uh, how long does it take to install a NASA lighter on top of the turbine? Uh, it's a uh, half a day. Um, yeah, if if everything is uh, for onshore, at least, uh, it's, if everything is under control, you have a uh, a way to to go on the turbine without any problem with a lift and everything it's less than let's say three or four hours but you must be prepared and all the procedure must be accepted yeah and just uh, just to say about the time for performing the power curve um, we we understand it's um, it's quicker with um, it could be quicker with the nacelle mounted lidar comparing to the mast but uh, the time, I'm not sure you answered. It's approximately two or three months. Am I correct, uh, more or less? Uh, it's the, um, yeah, two or three months. It will depend on the conditions, but just to have an idea of the time. Yeah, yeah it, I think it really depends. I think on a previous uh, seminar that we did actually last year, I showed uh, uh, an excellent timing that we had that we w were able to measure a power curve in uh, I think it was two weeks, something like that. But again, it really depends on the wind conditions. So, mm. but uh, yeah, typically I would say the same. Yeah, one month to, to two months. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah, um, yeah go ahead. No, I was just saying that uh, when we say measuring the power curve, it means fulfilling the requirement from the IEC. So having 180 hour of valid data and um, having uh, enough uh, coverage of the whole wind uh, speed uh, across the, um, uh, yeah, during the campaign. So that's what it means having a, a, a power curve. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Julien. Uh, I think this question for Pedro. What about having the brackets you showed in your presentation for onshore turbines? as well as an option in order to avoid tripods and holes. Yeah, um, I, th I think that's, uh, that's the way to go, probably. Um, I, I think on the onshore side, I think they are still starting uh, uh, to have this kind of uh, um, yeah, articulation between the R&D and the, the customers. It's taking a bit longer because the need is, nice, is was less, less proeminent, but I think that's the way to, to go, definitely. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Pedro. Uh, one more question uh, regarding when using a nacelle mounted LiDAR for power curve test without any mast, how do, we me how do you measure the vertical wind and inflow upflow angle? And same question for uh, turbulence and uh, all that kind of other measurements. Maybe, uh, I maybe, think Julia. Uh, Julia? Yeah, so, okay, um, so that's a tricky one. Um, the, the LiDAR itself is, real, is based on uh, assumption to, to measure the wind, and one of the main assumptions is that, um, and that's why it's, it's now focused on, on flat terrain, um, the main assumption is that we have a flow homogeneity. So, Basically, the, the assumption here is that there is no inflow, and this is why we, we focus the application for now on offshore and um, and um, and onshore flat terrain, and that's also why the the IEC is now only valid for flat terrain. All right. Okay. Thank uh, thank you very much, uh, Julien. I think uh, we are close to the end of uh, this uh, webinar session. Thank you, everyone for participating. Uh, we'll be uh, getting back to you for the unanswered questions. Um, 
uh, we will send you as well a link with all uh, relevant uh, resources as they haven't been uploaded. Uh, we encountered a problem, so don't worry about it. And please take the time uh, to answer this uh, last uh, this last slide poll questions. If you'd like to be contacted directly by Leosphere, if you'd like to get more information, uh, if you have additional questions, uh, feel free to say yes, and uh, you'll get an automatic uh, email, and we'll get back to you. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for participating, for attending this uh, webinar session, and we hope to see you uh, for our next webinar session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you.